Hi there, and welcome back to the Dutch Podcast. I'm Dr. Jacqueline Smeaton, and on this podcast, we dive into the vast and ever-evolving world of hormones as part of our lifelong pursuit of better health. Here at Dutch, we've dedicated over a decade to transforming lives by addressing hormonal imbalances like cycle irregularities, perimenopause, menopause, and more. Our mission is clear, to simplify and advance hormonal health for everyone. On this podcast, I get to bring you cutting edge insights from our top experts on hormone therapy, menopause, personalized medicine, and more. We're all aimed at making a real difference in your well being. Your questions and feedback are crucial. They shape our discussions and help us navigate the complexities of hormone health together. Now, as always, please remember the content of this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only, should not be considered medical advice. Be sure to consult your healthcare provider for medical advice diagnosis, and treatment. So on today's episode, we're going to talk about menopause and perimenopause, but really cover some of the things that we would call like the doorknob conversations, things that women may not bring up as primary complaints with their provider, but they're asking you as you're on your way out of the office, because this is one of the things that was really important to them and they hadn't brought it up yet. So we're going to be talking about libido, weight gain, and overall inflammation and chronic disease that can rise up during perimenopause and menopause. Today's expert has been in practice in Portland, Maine for years and has a really strong background in women's health. Dr. Karina Dunlap is a licensed naturopathic doctor and a medical researcher who has specialized in women's health and hormones throughout all stages of their life. Throughout her career, her mission has been to ensure that companies and individuals have access to information and education and solutions they need for real optimal health. She's an expert in natural fertility optimization and women's health, and her areas of focus include treating conditions like irregular periods, PMS, thyroid imbalances, endometriosis, pelvic pain, and menopause. She's an absolute pleasure, and we're really lucky to have her on the podcast today. Welcome, Dr. Dunlap. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. You know, we're talking about a topic that I think is so important, but before we dive into that, I'd love for you to share with our listeners And I love asking this question because I always find it so interesting. How did you get interested in naturopathic medicine and specifically like helping women to the level that you do in your practice? Yeah, my interest in helping women really goes way back. I, um, in high school, I was really actively involved in like women's health specific topics. I joined an underground paper, then I went and applied to Smith College, went to an all-women's college, then after college worked for Hour Bound, and I was specifically leading women, women, uh, backpacking groups and rock climbing groups. There was a lot of empowerment involved in that. And it really just led into, uh, my interest just in generally in like women's empowerment and then went to NUNM, um, where I got my naturopathic degree and just naturally was drawn into the women's health rotations and um, mentorships. And then I went and did Tori Hudson's residency, which is a very, competitive res- residency to get. And she was just so fantastic at um, mentoring me and then placing me all over Portland, Oregon with specialists in mostly in endocrinology from pediatrics to reproductive to menopause and um, general um, endocrinology. So, and that was so fantastic. And then her practice is really all women's health, mostly focused in menopause. Um, but I was able to see the full spectrum from peds all the way through end of life. So it's been just like really, truly an ongoing passion and love of mine that has developed over time. And you have two daughters now too, right? I do. And that is so- You get to carry that empowerment (laughs) onto them. It's like, it's like the universe conspired to like bring more girls. I know. Exactly. And I have a very, and they have a very, uh, women's empowerment framework from their father too. And like, his mother went to an all-women's college, which is so funny as well. So yeah, we do have a really sweet story. That's amazing. That's great. Well, I guess this is a great empowerment topic today, which is libido and sexual health in women, because I think it is something that a lot of women still feel shame around talking about. Even in a medical setting, it can be really hard to bring this up. Um, so we're really focused on postmenopausal women today, but I think I'd love to start by just understanding like how big of a problem is this for women and how do you even create an environment where people feel comfortable talking about it? Yeah, I think it's um, 
greatly under discussed inside a clinical setting. Many women feel and come in with like these what they consider maybe more important physiologic concerns. And then the libido piece takes like a secondary place where it might be really truly in the forefront of their mind. I find women, even in a naturopathic setting, which tends to, I feel like, and I'm definitely biased, but I feel that people are more comfortable in speaking about all aspects of their health, um, perhaps, and maybe then maybe in their like 15 minute visit with their conventional care doc, but they, often we'll leave the libido conversation to the end and they'll say, and by the mm. way, and I'm always like, oh yes. And when by the way is often like one of those things that they really wanted to bring up earlier, but often don't. Um, and so I find it to be, and I find it to be like one of those, not like forgotten um, topics, but it's like, it's just not prioritized. And it's actually can be quite a big piece of feeling happy in in one's life and feeling fulfilled in one's life. I'm so glad you bring that up. And and I have a special word for those like, oh, just one more thing conversations. <laughs> I call them doorknob conversations because yeah. they always happen like when your hand is on the doorknob about <laughs> yeah. to leave the room and it's like, right. wait a second. It's like, this is your last chance to get in what you really want to talk about and you've been yeah. kind of stepping around. Exactly. Um, but I love the way you frame that because this is an important part of who we are as yeah. human beings. So yeah. regardless of your positions on like, you know, relationships and things like your way that you interact intimately with a partner or whoever is a really important aspect of ourselves as a being and as women. And so it's great to have providers who are attuned to that, who know how to ask about that um, and who know how to bring it, bring it up. So does, how many women does this affect? Is this really common challenge or unusual Yeah, no, it's extremely common, especially in the perimenopausal years, which is perimenopause and beyond, which is I know what we want, we're we're talking about here today. It's incredibly common, um, at least half of the population that is in our practice will actively talk about this. I think it affects many more than that. Um, Like I said, it's one of those kind of topics that doesn't get brought up enough. But it is incredibly common. And for many, many reasons, physiologically, we see um, hormonal shifts are a massive part of that. Tell me a little bit more about the hormonal shifts, like what's going on that you end up seeing libido impacted? Yeah, there are, I, there are what I consider like primary hormones involved and then secondary hormones involved. Um, our primary hormones being mainly estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and um, a little bit of oxytocin too, which I'll talk about. Estrogen, we know estrogen is like a major lubricating hormone. Um, We can, you know, really start by talking about how estrogen depletion impacts vaginal tissue, um, labile tissue. Um, Certainly we see estrogen declining can create more dryness and and, um, discomfort during intimacy. Um, We see it can it contribute to atrophy of the vulvar clitoris and tissues all around the area and internally as well. So it can de- um, increase discomfort or create discomfort, um, thin the, vag- the vaginal and vulvar walls, um, and negatively therefore impact sexual in- in- intimacy, desire, and function. Um, but also it has a bigger place in like whole body health and affect many, many aspects of our, of our lives and how we feel. And um, it can really influence also mood and psychological health. So that really does play in so hugely into the conversation mm-hmm. about sexual interest, um, arousal, libido, everything there too. Progesterone is uh, one of our anxiolytic hormones. It's very relaxing when we have it, when we don't, it can create um, more mood um, dysregulation. We see decreases in progesterone also impacting sleep and therefore energy levels. So when we are less energetic, we can tend to have less interest and also less ability for arousal. Testosterone is a hormone that people want to jump to, I think, right away when we talk about libido and sexual interest. Um, It's one of the hormones that's important, but not the only hormone that's important, but certainly can influence sexual desire and other aspects related to libido and sexual interest. And then oxytocin, um, otherwise known as like our love hormone, can fluctuate greatly during perimenopause and beyond because estrogen influences the amount of oxytocin. So oxytocin is often what 
someone might experience when they're breastfeeding a baby and they have that love and connection with that baby, or they might experience that in an intimacy and closeness with a partner. And that can fluctuate and decline and decrease um, in perimenopause and beyond. So those are what I consider our primary hormones. Um, some other things that really impact our sexual interests, libido, sexual function, are the um, more psychological factors that can, can come into play during perimenopause and beyond that will influence the whole relationship, di relationship dynamic. Um, Self-image comes into play as lots of body changes are happening, and um, that can very much influence how somebody might feel in their intimacy space with a partner or with themselves. And yeah, then, another big yeah. – oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, and then some of the other like secondary hormones that come into the picture as well are cortisol and thyroid, which definitely go under-discussed when we're thinking about perimenopause and beyond. Yeah, I love that you talk about the relational piece. And I think another aspect that's so interesting is this is a time in life where a lot of times children move out. Yeah. You know, they move out of the house, they go to college, and it you end up having to almost rebuild a relationship with a partner because it's just the two of you compared yeah. to your roles as parents, Definitely. you know, or raising children together if that was part of your life. Like that can also be such a big piece of that relationship dynamic change, like more time together, focus on each other. And that can be a positive thing. And sometimes it can be a challenging thing for people to, to change through as well. Absolutely. And, and sometimes that really impacts like the framework for which people see each other or themselves and just like their whole purpose, right? And mm -hmm. there's a lot of self-identity work that can go into this time of life too. And yeah, exactly. It's a big yeah. change. Another question that I always ask my female patients who come in with complaints of low libido is like, is your libido enough for you? Yeah. And is it enough for your partner? Do you ever see where there's mismatches there, where when you're evaluating a woman who's saying, I have low libido, you're like, you actually don't have low libido. <laughs> you just have a partner who wants, you know, intimacy twice as much as you do. And it's a mismatch more than a medical condition. It's such a good point. I have some really interesting memories and cases of that exact scenario. And I really like to get specific when they come in and say low libido too, because is it is it interest in being intimate or being sexual? Is it arousal difficulty? Is it orgasm? Like I like to define those three areas independently. And then in addition, like you said, is it about your your interest and your function and your desire or is it about your partners and is there a mismatch? Um, I definitely see that in clinical practice where the partner might have an increased desire and it might have been their whole entire relationship or might be heightened during the perimenopause and menopause time and beyond um, or different forms of intimacy that are pleasurable during different times of life as well. Mm. So um, somebody might prefer a certain form of intimacy that becomes more painful or just comfort uncomfortable for the partner during um, perimenopause and beyond. And some of that can be mitigated with treatments and other times it's just what is pleasurable then might not be pleasurable now. And really defining that is super important. Those are such good points because I think if you're experiencing like with vaginal atrophy, for example, or vaginal mm -hmm. dryness, if intercourse became uncomfortable, then there's going to be a natural like deterrent from that pain or discomfort. So a lot of what can be done, and we can talk about this with kind of menopause, is like the ability to, you know, use lubricants, use a vaginal estrogen treatment, something to cause, to really reduce the pain. Yeah. You know, th that there's so many different options available, but it would be a natural response to say like, this used to be pleasurable, but now it's not, it hurts. So I don't really want to, you know, to pursue that intimacy anymore. Um, so I love that you bring that up. The other thing that I think is really interesting is they've done a lot more work now on like on arousal or on libido between differences between men and women and found that for women, it's more about whether they're open, they have an openness to a relational interaction versus having this yearning desire when you're alone to like be thinking about what you want to do with your partner. It's more about an openness to, or a receptivity um, yeah. to having, you know, an intimate experience, which I think is so in interesting because like we have to think about libido as being a different definition yeah. than we do in men. 
Right. Have you explored that at all? Oh, yeah, definitely. It's so fascinating to me that so many pieces fill, like, lead into a libido conversation. And it might be the type of support one has in a household, the type of intimacy and closeness they feel with that partner in just regular conversation and being understood. And it might have to do with all these different pinpoint moments that lead up to a moment of intimacy and so much less about a physical desire and so much more about like a relation, relational relationship and the status of that uh, closeness and that experience of closeness. And yeah, like you said, receptivity, I think is a really great way of defining it. Yeah. I love Esther Perel's work. You mentioned that, like the role you play and like, if you've not read her books and you want to really learn a new type of language to utilize with your patients and clients. That's like written for the user, for the consumer, but it's so well-spoken the way she describes how, especially for women, you can't really wear multiple hats at one time. Yeah, exactly. So you do need to have that, um, you know, you need to have the space to be able to be a woman and, you know, versus just a mother or just a worker, just a cleaner, whatever those things are. It's hard to do both at the same time. (laughs) Exactly. Um, so do you use a Dutch test in your practice? I do. I love the Dutch. Thank you. Uh, t- <laughs> tell me a little bit about the key things you look at on a Dutch test when you're using yeah. it to evaluate libido in a postmenopausal female. Yeah. Well, the Dutch test does a fabulous fabulous job of um, showing a big androgen anal- analyte panel. So like there are so many more, there are so many more specific things we're looking at testosterone is one of them, but we want to look at things like DHEA or epitestosterone. We want to look at the downstream metabolism of testosterone. We want to see how it converts into estrogen. So as I mentioned earlier, there are multiple hormones involved in libido when we're talking about hormones and libido. And so we want to look at multiple hormones at the same time when we're establishing really what is the need in this treatment plan? Like what, if we're going to pinpoint a treatment plan and we're going to invest time and energy and money in to really, really, really prioritizing and creating a plan that's unique to that individual, we need to know what we're dealing with. Are we dealing with anovulation and somebody not ovulating really regularly? And so their progesterone is really more the pick, the big picture than the testosterone. Are we dealing with estrogen more? Are we dealing with all three? Are we dealing with somebody who is, has had acute acute stress or long-term stress and that, and we'll be looking at like their cortisol panel for that, um, to establish and evaluate that. So I think it's really incredibly helpful to clarify which hormones may be of highest, highest on the list of those involved. And then it was somebody who's struggling with, with libido, um, concerns, and then how to quickly and accurately pinpoint the, the treatment plan to get to that something that's effective as quickly as possible. And then if somebody is on something like HRT or TRT, we can also evaluate the effectiveness of those treatments um, to, I mean, we can evaluate that through question and answer and like just the detailed intake with that person. But it's really nice to know, like, how are things being metabolized and what does that look like for that individual, which is unique amongst every person? Absolutely. Absolutely. And now tell me a little bit about, I mean, the treatment plans around libido must be pretty diverse because you're looking at a lot of different factors that can be in the mix and really creating something that's customized. But are there things that you look at more frequently for patients, specifically for postmenopausal females when it comes to libido? Yeah, definitely. I mean, like ultimately, ultimately, when I think about like the big goal, I I think about having women feel as sexy in their bodies as possible at any age or any stage of life and whatever size body they have. So I feel like there's no limit really. I mean, there's like, I feel, I really feel that this is like the ultimate goal is having them feel good inside their body. So that's so multifactorial and multi-hormonal, right? And in terms of my questioning and, and thought process. I do love starting with labs. I think labs are a fantastic way to start, Um, but you gain so much by looking at labs plus intake. So for example, if somebody's coming in and maybe they're super duper early in their perimenopausal transition and you've tested and you can see that and they're really well within their like reproductive age range for testing and in their terms of their symptoms, they might not be somebody you're going to approach with something like 
um, hormones right away as exogenous hormones, um, or um, you might be considering doing some other things for them initially. So it totally depends on like what stage, if they're late perimenopause or if they're postmenopause, that would be a different scenario. So getting people feeling sexy in their bodies as quickly as possible, and then asking more of those detailed questions about the intimacy, the relationship, and the interest there, and getting like un- getting to the questions underneath the questions, getting the like backstory, getting in between the lines with somebody is important. Um, when it comes to like targeting the treatment plan, a lot will depend on those those initial evaluations. Um, do you want me to jump right into like where I like to go with treatment plans? Or we can, yeah, if you're willing to share. I mean, again, none of this is cook- a cookie cutter approach when you're oh working my with gosh, an MD. No. So, listeners, keep that in mind. This is, of course, you'd be customizing it, but yeah, we'd love to know what you're using that's working. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when it comes to feeling. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to feeling sexy in our bodies or feeling libido, so we like focusing on pelvic pelvic health and vaginal health is like primary and so critical, right? Um, but also focusing on how we feel in our entire body, but really making sure like we've asked all those questions. How hydrated do you feel? How is the tissue strength? I'm um, doing an evaluation, a, a physical evaluation of the tissue can be helpful too. If that person is a good candidate for a vaginal estrogen and they're in those perimenopausal years, I think it's like one of my, it is one of my favorite <laughs> treatments because it's so incredibly effective, so safe. And we've seen the benefits for so many years beyond um, early perimenopause and beyond. So I absolutely, absolutely love vaginal estrogen when used correctly and used safely. It's life-changing for women um, and it can be incredibly hydrating and moisturizing and it just can really help women feel more comfortable in their sexual experience. If they are having other issues, that can come along with perimenopause and beyond like leakage or if they're having um, other discomfort or pelvic pain in when they're experiencing sex, it's good to evaluate like where is the pain coming from? Where exactly do they feel it? Is there something else going on structurally? Well, let's get that evaluated. Let's get some imaging done. Perhaps there's something else there. I mean, common things might be like an endometriosis or fibroids or something going on like that, that it takes a more detailed in detailed and more com- perhaps complex approach. Um, but getting getting that pelvic floor strength and um, tissue health evaluated and like also just looking at it from a structural standpoint, really, really important. Um, blood flow is another thing I think about when we talk about pelvic health, um, because many, many women have spent many, many years sitting in a chair Mm -hmm. or, you know, not necessarily moving their bodies in the best possible way, maybe prioritizing others um, instead of themselves. Um, And so thinking about like, what is the blood flow situation like? And are they moving their bodies? Is that area losing strength and losing um, receptivity to, you know, and is that part of it? So talking about strengthening the pelvic floor, staying hydrated, staying lubricated, and all the ways we can do that. And some of the other ways we can do that with natural lubricants or other lubricants, certainly keeping up with like omegas and some of those nutrient rich um, dietary aspects that can help improve um, hydration and lubrication as well. Fabulous. Yeah. And then, I mean, we can go into so many directions here. (laughs) I mean, in terms of treatment, I have thousands of thoughts and ideas. I want to make sure women are feeling, sometimes it's about like their gut health and that they're feeling more bloated and they're not feeling good in their gut and that translates into the pelvis. And so we talk a lot about GI health and then moving up from there, you know, how is, how is their relationship? I'm thinking like the heart area. And then I'm thinking about the head, right? Um, if we're like just kind of going base up, um, and how is that relationship doing? And is there any, you know, need for therapy or close connection or time, making time for other forms of connection that maybe they haven't done or explored yet? And then like, how are things um, with their mental health and how can we support those um, aspects? Some of the things that women, not some of the things, but some common things that are, that women struggle with are mood concerns during perimenopause and beyond that go under-evaluated and under-treated, anxiety, depression become more rampant, two times as likely for women in during these mm-hmm. transitional times. And then um, sleep concerns are big as well. And so, so much can impact our interest in, in sex, our interest in intimacy, um, that 
play into those aspects as well. Well, I love the whole person approach that you take. I can tell you're very thoughtful and very thorough about this with patients. And really, listeners should walk away understanding this is not just about your hormone levels. That's a big piece of it, but you're really hearing just how complicated it can be to unravel a low libido complaint in a a doctor's office for sure. Well, let's shift gears and talk about another complaint that's very common for menopausal females, which is weight gain. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why do we see changes in the ability to like maintain or lose weight during menopause? Yeah, this is massive. So many people, I think, just kind of like sum it up to, oh, I'm I'm getting older, so my metabolism is changing. And they just kind of chalk it up to that. But it's so much more nuanced and, and there's so many reasons for this. And so we just focus on like hormonal reasons for this. We know estrogen plays a big part. So in um, the way that our bodies distribute um, fat tissue or adipose tissue, um, we know that decline in estrogen can lead to more adipose tissue, uh, fat tissue. So around the abdomen versus the hips and thighs, we know it can increase more there, which can create a lot of changes um, along the lines of insulin resistance and um, our appetites can really shift based on our estrogen changes as well. We know that the estrogen and progesterone changes really influence our sleep, our amount of deep sleep and our amount of um, quality sleep. And those sleep patterns can greatly influence our metabolic rate. Um, Progesterone declining can also influence things like fluid retention, um, our mood and our eating habits. Testosterone, when our when we go through perimenopause and beyond, often testosterone will decline and that can influence our muscle mass and the decreased muscle mass can therefore also influence our metabolic rate. Um, And then I mentioned insulin and insulin sensitivity. We often see more blood sugar dysregulation in perimenopause and beyond. That's really, really common. You can see it on lab work. Often folks who have never struggled with blood sugar issues before will will see that start to pop up, especially if there's some disordered eating or disordered eating habits um, and, and mixed in with maybe some disordered like movement habits. And then cortisol can influence um, our metabolism as well. And like a flipped cortisol curve, we might see, you know, low cortisol in the morning. We might see high cortisol at night. That kind of pattern would be problematic for somebody who is wanting to maintain a healthy metabolic weight um, or healthy metabolic rate, excuse me. And then thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is like Mm. the forgotten hormone in perimenopause and beyond. And it's something... So in my awareness, and I think in your awareness too, Dr. Smeaton, because of our work in fertility care, but um, it's one of the things that just gets left out of the conversation in those years between having our kids and perimenopause and beyond. But often we see thyroid dysfunction and and, um, changes in thyroid health during the perimenopausal years. And in addition, we see that when we add estrogen into the mix for people who are on HRT, we see that that will increase something called sex hormone binding globulin, which can decrease the amount of, I'm sorry, thyroid binding globulin, which um, can decrease the amount of active thyroid hormone in the body. And so we we see that folks who do need thyroid hormone or who have been on thyroid hormone therapy often need changes in their dosing or they might need to start if they haven't before. Yeah, that's a great point. And something that I think you know, especially if your symptoms are subtle, like if you came in with overt hypothyroidism, with fatigue, hair loss, constipation, kind of those classic signs, yeah. your provider might pick up on it. But like slight fatigue and a little bit of weight gain, if you're in that kind of subclinical picture, I could see that being written off and not really evaluated and tested in a perimenopausal yeah. woman because it's like, oh, you know, yeah, that is what happens around this time. Definitely. Don't worry about it. Right. Yeah. So, what, tell me a little bit about the role that diet and exercise should play in a peri- and postmenopausal female. Is there a specific regime that you like? There's so much out there now where it's like <laughs> yeah. intermittent fast. Don't intermittent fast. It's too stressful for you. <laughs> Lift weights, but not too heavy. Don't do CrossFit. <laughs> Definitely do CrossFit. What are the recommendations that you generally make for your patients? Oh, my goodness. You're right. It's like such a – it feels like a jungle. Um, when patients come in, they feel very overwhelmed by this. And – 
I think it does always comes back to that individual and what they really need to start focusing on. Some haven't really been moving much at all. They really need to get their bodies moving. Some have not been, have been able to get away with eating a more processed foods diet and not, it hasn't been showing up for them. And all of a sudden it starts showing up in their bodies and they're like, okay, I need to totally rework how I eat now or how I work out. Others have been maintaining a fairly healthy lifestyle or active lifestyle, but now they're needing to get more nuanced about how they work out and how how they fuel themselves for those workouts. A big focus of mine is keeping our muscles healthy through these years because it influences everything. It influences our energy. It influences our longevity. It influences our um, strength and um, vitality moving through these years and beyond. And um, so leveraging like exercise for the the best um, uh, for the best muscle protein um, muscle synthesis is really, really important. Um, and how we eat and how we exercise and how that influences like not only our muscle health, but also our cortisol and thyroid health is really always like at the top of my mind. So I'm a big um, fan of um, Gabrielle Lyon and Stacey Sims's work. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I've been able to also see in clinical practice is there's a, there's like a rampant, um, has been a rampant focus on under eating to Mm -hmm. like improve one's metabolic physique, um, um, in, in often in their earlier years and they come in, in these perimenopausal years or beyond, and they know they need to eat more protein, but what they don't also maybe realize is that they need to just eat more in general. Um, and that might be fueling some thyroid dysfunction, or that might be fueling some, um, difficulty maintaining and building the kind of muscle that they're looking to build. Um, so I'm a really big fan of like the pre and post fueling around exercise. Um, I'm not as much of a big fan of doing long extended fasting windows for women in their perimenopausal years and beyond. And that extends into my knowledge around like how that influences their cortisol rhythm and then also their um, thyroid health as well. So too often I see like these subclinical or borderline hypothyroid patients who are just way under eating and maybe they're stressing themselves out by trying to do more HIIT workouts or, um, the high intensity or they're trying to do, um, yeah, they're just, they're pushing it at too hard on the exercise front under fueling and under and underdoing um, when they eat. And so mm-hmm. I really, really like, I like, I like, I really prefer people not be fasting when they work out and that they fuel themselves with a good amount of protein post exercise and that exercise, what, what type of exercise they do. I think during this time, there's a much more, there's much more efficiency when we do more strength training kind of, um, strength training type workouts, um, that can be really, really effective for maintaining body habitus for helping to keep our metabolic rate where we want to keep it. Um, they can be incredibly helpful and efficient. Um, but if people are feeling like they can do more active or, or higher intensity work, it's great and can also be very helpful. It's just fueling appropriately for that. So I'm a big fan of, you know, starting the day with a certain amount of proteins and making sure there are some healthy fats in there, getting our fibers in, getting lots and lots of diversity in the diet. And then after workouts, really fueling as well within a certain critical window, which is typically within like a 30 to 60 minute window. Those are great suggestions. And I love that you're not um, like dogmatic yeah. about it. Uh-uh. And actually one thing that really stood out to me, um, there's a guy that I like walk, follow on Instagram, Lee Norton, his handle is like at bio lane. I don't know if you've ever seen his stuff. Uh-uh. He's a bodybuilder, does a ton of nutrition, but he like prides himself, like PhD, loves evidence. He reports yeah. on a lot of studies in like exercise science. Yeah. And one of the things he talked about was like, if we're talking about intermittent fasting and red light therapy and I don't know, cold plunges. Yeah. We but we're not talking about consistent movement and consistent exercise. We're really missing the point and I think right. that our field can tend to go in that direction sometimes. Exactly. And yeah. that really almost all diet types, Mediterranean, paleo, whatever, if you list them, most can be effective as long yeah. as you're consistent with it. And the same yeah. thing with weight training 
or with exercise and movement, it's more important that you find something you can stick with. Yeah. Than the nuanced details. But I love the focus on protein, focus on muscle building. And of course, when you're lifting weights, you're building muscle, but you're also strengthening bone. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, right. You know, that's exactly. another just benefit as you move into menopause. So yeah. you're know, protecting the weight, protecting your bones. Love it, love it, love it. Exactly. Yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about in regards to menopause is that we tend to see in this time a lot of increased rate of chronic disease development. Mm -hmm. Now, part of this is like a lifetime of exposure Mm -hmm. culminating and accumulating over time. But there's also some changes that happen during menopause related to, you mentioned insulin resistance. Yeah. I'll throw that in the mix. And also inflammation that can change, like hormones change, which predispose us to a greater, you know, risk in a lot of areas. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like how does the changes that we see in women in menopause and perimenopause set us up for more challenges when it comes to inflammatory balance and and blood glucose? Yeah, sure. So we have to absolutely, absolutely focus on estrogen in this category of inflammation and the changes in our bodies in perimenopause and beyond, because we know with the decline in estrogen, which is natural, there is a natural increase in inflammation because estrogen has a very anti-inflammatory effect on the body in multiple aspects of, um, and for multiple reasons. But when we talk about inflammation, we have to talk about the immune system clearly um, as well. But we know that decrease in estrogen can actually activate some of those more pro-inflammatory cytokines or those protein, intercellular protein complexes and signaling proteins um, that can make us feel all different ways. So they can make us feel uncomfortable. They can make us feel more anxious. They can make us feel more depressed. Um, And those, um, the increase in those cytokines is really prominent as estrogen declines. Um, We also know that the changes like the insulin resistance can lead to more of that, the changes in our body habitus that can lead to um, us not metabolizing as well and and experiencing other dysregulated systems such as gut health as well. So we also have um, estrogen receptors along the GI and that can also lead to the decline in estrogen can lead to some more inflammation. If you think about like how estrogen is very, um, it's very lubricating. It's also very lubricating to the, to the GI and the entire um, GI lining. And that can really influence how our bodies are digesting. Are digesting, And if we think about the immune system being living and residing in so many ways along that GI tract, there is a big influence there as well. So with this decline in estrogen, mm-hmm. that can kind of predispose us to higher levels of inflammation. And, you know, you don't get that kind of easing, calming benefit to the immune system. Do women need to be proactive about managing inflammation in menopause? And if the answer is yes, what are some of the things that you're recommending that they do? Yeah, they do. They absolutely do need to be more proactive. And I think coming into this time, like I think so many women don't want to think about it until they're there. They're like, no, it's not happening. It's not happening or I don't want it. And then it's just happening all of a sudden. And then they're realizing I just can't get away with this or that, or I have to be like so much more on top of my routines, whether that means my eating routines or my caffeine routines or my, Mm -hmm. you know, my sleep routines. And they're just realizing like, I just am not There's just so much more, um, the veil has been, you know, the veil has been lifted and there, yeah, (laughs) there's no hiding behind anything anymore. You just like, you're kind of face to face with your true habits. And so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity during this time to say like, okay, I'm, I, I'm going to live the rest of my life in good health. And so what am I going to do to be proactive about that? Um, we talked about exercise and nutrition. So like eating enough, eating enough of the right kinds of foods, eating at the right times of the day, not letting blood sugar go unchecked or rampantly fluctuating up and down, knowing what our blood sugar levels are, knowing if we have a propensity or um, if our bodies are more likely to become pre-diabetic, if that's part of like our family history or part of our, our own personal history and really staying on top of that, eating a diet rich in our macronutrients, but also our micronutrients, um, 
a diet rich in certain like things like omega threes can be incredibly important and helpful during this time. Lots of good um, vitamins are incredibly anti-inflammatory. Um, vitamin A, C, E, D. These all have really anti-inflammatory properties. Um, I also like to think about like polyphenol rich foods. So mm. all the colors, um, you know, the rainbow color, we talk about like rainbow diet just for a reason, because it's very polyphenol rich. And these polyphenols can have a very anti-inflammatory effect. Um, things like if, if people are doing caffeine, things like green tea is very polyphenol rich, has an anti-inflammatory effect. We know that like our reds, our reds food, red foods are very are very, very good for the GI tract. Things like apples and cherries, plums, um, blackberries, things like that can be really helpful for the GI tract and very anti-inflammatory. Um, we know things like spinach and green apples, um, celery, olives, these kinds of things also are rich in flavonoids, um, which can be incredibly anti-inflammatory. And then minerals, we want to be very mineral um aware because a lot of our foods are mineral, minerally depleted and a lot of our diets are minerally depleted. So are we getting enough basic minerals? Magnesium is one of those that I focus on with my patients. Mm. Things like zinc and iodine are incredibly important as well. Um, other, other things I'd be thinking about are like natural anti-inflammatory supports that can be added into a diet or added in as a supplement whether that's in the form of capsule, tea, liquid, tincture, you know, things like turmeric, we know super anti-inflammatory. Ginger is one of those things that can be brought into any, like so many easily in, tied in, in food form or in, or, in, or in supplement form. I love garlic in the diet, um, bromelain, omega-3, as I mentioned earlier, those are some of my favorite anti-inflammatory things to bring into a plan. Um, but then just really like keeping our sleep in good check, keeping our stress in good check, and then really focusing on, um, our rhythms throughout the day. Mm. Like there's so much to this light exposure and circadian rhythm support that then influences our, our cortisol and our stress, um, our stress, our stress hormone. So, um, we can really get really synced in with the sun, morning and evening sun, and that can really help support us from an inflammation standpoint as well. I love that. You give so many great suggestions that are really can just be incorporated as part of your daily living, you know, eating a diverse rainbow of foods, you know, you mentioned teas, light, I mean, these and sleep, these are like yeah. some things that are routine. You're not talking about fancy, expensive interventions, which yeah. I love. So we can go there. That. We can go there, but <laughs> we don't but I think often start with the basics. Yeah, exactly, right? like, exactly. And I think you're really like when you're in those perimenopause and early menopausal years, it's a really good time. Yeah. Like you said, the veil's lifted. You have to look your yeah. behaviors in the face. Yeah. So starting with those makes a lot of sense and exactly. can actually take people quite a long way before you even layer on a higher force intervention, even like a exactly. supplement, you exactly. know, which I love. Right. Or hormones. Well, this has been awesome. I think so many women find value in talking about these things that come up so frequently during menopause and perimenopause. So really have appreciated having you on today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dunlop. Thank you so much, Dr. Smeaton. It's so wonderful to be here. It's great to see you. You too. If you're wanting to learn and really expand your expertise in hormones, you're not going to want to miss our podcast. So make sure you tune in each and every week for our new content.